Hello everybody, here on the channel I pride myself on the wide variety of cars that I feature. For that reason, every winter I put a post out on the community page asking people to bring me their winter beaters, and you, the wonderful people that you are, flood my inbox with offers of such cars. However, there are a few that don't quite match that description, but are still well worth featuring. And this is one of those. This is a 2015 Rolls-Royce Phantom 7 extended wheelbase. It's big. Really big. There is, of course, a lot more to this car than just that, but it's worth taking a moment to explain quite how large this really is. For some context, a classic Mini is a tiny car, about three meters long. A modern day BMW M3 is not a tiny car, that's about 4.8 meters long. My Maserati Quattroporte was just over five meters long, and a current long wheelbase seven series is five and a quarter meters. This is just shy of 6.1. It is in fact so large that here in Britain it requires special side reflectors like you'd have on a truck. And in China, you need a whole different category of driving license to even get behind the wheel. Blimey. The car also weighs two and three quarter tons. It's no flyweight. And knowing that, the engine seems almost underpowered. It's a BMW naturally aspirated V12, codename N73, a very close relative of the unit found in my old 760LI. However, where that displaced six litres, this displaces six and three quarters. It makes only a little bit more power, 450 horses versus the 440 in the BM, but it makes a lot more torque, 531 pound feet, that's around 720 newton metres. And here it's been tuned for refinement and smoothness rather than overall power. It's paired to an eight speed ZF automatic gearbox. The Phantom 7 was the first car produced by Rolls-Royce under their new owners, BMW. But just because it has BM power at the front, don't think for a second this is simply a stretched 7 Series, because it's not. This was built on an all-new platform, and it's um rather impressive. It's actually all aluminium, using a number of extrusions, much like you'd find in a Lotus Elise or an Aston Martin V8 Vantage. Being a Rolls-Royce though, even in the 21st century, they like to do things a little bit differently. There are things I'm sure you probably already know, like the fact the spirit of ecstasy at the front will vanish if you try and pinch it. The Rolls-Royce emblems on the wheels stay upright at all times. However, there's also stuff you probably don't know about, like the fact that the side windows at the front are heated. You have probably also seen plenty of videos from the Rolls-Royce factory down at Goodwood where these beautiful coach lines are still applied by hand. However, what's unusual about this car is that these are not original. They were in fact applied by the dealer, P&A Wood, who are a very well-known Rolls-Royce and Bentley specialist. I am also told that the Rolls-Royce ownership experience is just about as good as you could possibly imagine. Not only is the service friendly, polite and efficient, but you get a lot more than you might expect too. So if you buy a provenance car, is the name for their used scheme, you get two years free servicing and warranty, including things like brake discs and pads. And that's much better than I thought it would be. The key for the car will be familiar to anyone that's owned a BMW in the last sort of 15 years, and it works as you might expect it. It locks, unlocks the car, and also allows you to get into the boot, which is naturally electric, a very good size, doesn't appear all that big until you realize just how deep it is. And under one of these two very nice covers, you will find one of the largest owner's manuals I have ever seen, which is finished in the same leather as the interior of the car, and on the front page even has the exact chassis number and specification of the car too. That's nice. In a short while, I am gonna be driving this car, but let's be honest here, it's a long wheelbase Rolls-Royce. The important seats are not those, they're these. Accessed by these rear hinged, AKA suicide doors, and inside them you have the famous Rolls-Royce Brolly. And fear not, if you have been caught in the rain, the compartment is ventilated too, making sure your Brolly is dry whenever you need it. 
Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, this is a spectacular place to be. But if your idea of luxury is a brand new S-Class, you may at first glance be rather disappointed because from where I'm sat now, I have no screens, no dials to play with, not really all that much. But take a little moment longer and you begin to realize just how special this car is. It starts with something as simple as closing the door. Seems very awkward and inelegant trying to reach out and grab a very, very heavy door. That's why there's a button for it. These dials on the side here, very traditional feeling, beautifully made. You have a temperature and fan controller here. You have a window switch, which is not currently working, but is beautifully damped when the car is on and it will go up and down. What this car really gives you is a proper education in what true luxury really is. Because for me, you see screens, gizmos, technology, and all that sort of stuff, they're not really luxury. They're gimmicks, they're lovely to have, and you do expect them on a luxury car. But those things date, those things age. This will always be a very, very nice place to spend your time. The leather is beautiful and soft. The lamb's wool carpets are deep and thick. The quality of the multiple woods in here is absolutely spectacular. This also has the optional fiber optic starlight headliner. And if you thought for a moment that Rolls-Royce were simply being lazy by not putting any technology in their car, you'd be wrong. Because they have, they've just hidden it. Cleverly disguised as a picnic table. This is quite nice. Even up front, things are done very differently here. Posh, needlessly complicated HVAC controls, not a bit of it. Well engineered, very easy to use dials. I love it. The steering wheel, beautiful, traditional in its sizing. The fact it's rather thin rimmed, but with some modern looking buttons here that are very nice indeed. Stalks that are not just pinched out of the BMW parts bin. The now famous power reserve gauge in place of a rev counter because that would simply be gaudy and unnecessary. And much like in the rear, there is technology, but it's all been carefully stowed away. Even the seat controls, which are glorious and elegant, are hidden under this. The armrest doesn't have as much space as you might think, but you've got an aux in, a USB, and delightfully, the phone holder for an old Nokia. You have this drawer here, beautifully damped and glorious in its motion. Not quite sure what the purpose of it is. I can only imagine it's for extra large Winston Churchill type cigars. And like in the rear, there is technology, but it's all very hidden. If you were thinking this car doesn't have any screens, you would be wrong. Powering this car is a BMW style iDrive system, but neatly hidden away. To get to it, press this or the button here. The screen will rotate much like in a Bentley, only Rolls-Royce did it first. And you've got what is, to be honest, rebranded iDrive, but there's no problem with that because iDrive is very good. As is the stereo in here. Rolls-Royce don't do brand stereos, Bose, JBL, or name anything like that. This isn't an upgraded item, but it is still very, very good. You will also find the usual laundry list of features you get in pretty much any luxury car. Soft closed doors, double glazing, etc, etc. But the Phantom 7 was a very, very important car for a couple of reasons. Not only was it the first car to be released under BMW's ownership, for nearly seven years it was also the only car on sale by Rolls-Royce. So it had to be good especially when it cost as much as it did. This one, with a rather modest 40-odd thousand pounds of options, cost new in 2015, 403,000 pounds. This is a Series 2 car, which was introduced in around 2012, the model having been brought in in 2003 and finally discontinued in 2017. Even today, if you want to buy a car like this, you'll have to part with the thick end of 200,000 quid. So, is it worth it? Time to drive a Rolls Royce. So here's the funny thing with Rolls Royce. They're all enormous. Even the small one, the Ghost, is still longer than any S-Class or 7 Series long wheelbase, which is why I was so perplexed when they introduced the Cullinan, because if you parked any average large 4x4 next to this, it would already 
be dwarfed. The idea of someone saying, mm, I like a Rolls Royce, but they're just not big enough. It's just bizarre. This thing's huge. Today I actually have the car's owner in the rear seats and he's about half a mile away. We could draw swords with one another and not make contact. It'll be perfectly safe. As you may expect, the general feeling you get in this car is reasonably serene. A couple of things that you notice, road noise is a little more pronounced than expected. Tyres, as it happens, are a bit of an issue with this car because there aren't all that many available in its rather unusual sizes. They're quite broad, but they also have a lot of profile. This means if you want to buy one, people know what it's for. The net result is that if you want to put fresh rubber on this car, you're looking at the thick end of 600 quid a corner, and that's if you buy them yourself. Running costs is a little bit of an oddity. Because this car has two years of free servicing, we don't really know how much it is. The warranty, I am told, is an extortionate amount to extend, although when the owner asked p &A Wood how much an extra year is, they didn't exactly want to say. My guess is between five to 10,000 pounds. I'm hoping somebody in the comment section will know exactly, and if you do, please do share with the rest of the class. The general idea, though, is that for most people who buy one of these cars, after two years, they'll probably change it for something else, and then you get another two years warranty and servicing. To be honest, the way these things actually work out, this is probably one of the cheaper ways to own a Rolls-Royce. Don't mistake that for me saying a Rolls-Royce is cheap to own. There is no such thing, much in the same way that there really isn't a cheap Ferrari. In fact, the most expensive of Rolls Royces will probably be the ones that you paid very little for to begin with. Despite its enormous size, at the moment, not actually feeling all that daunted by this car. Yes, there's an awful lot of it behind me, but I'm never really worried about that bit, because if I've got that end of it through, everything's fine. Ordinarily, anything with a near 7-litre V12, you would expect to be dominated by the engine. However, Rolls-Royce have always tried to do as much as they can to hide the fact these cars have any kind of motor whatsoever. They're soon to introduce one of their first electric cars, and I happen to think Rolls-Royce is one of the brands that really would suit that, because the whole ethos of smooth, linear, quiet power is very Rolls-Royce. That being said, this V12 does an excellent job. As you'll see very shortly, power is certainly adequate. Rolls-Royce did actually dabble for a brief while with building a V16 engine, a 9-litre one, if memory serves. That car actually made an appearance in the film Johnny English, of all things. It was a real car, it did actually work and drive, it wasn't just a mock-up. The sole reason that engine didn't actually make it into production is that Rolls-Royce said it simply couldn't achieve the same level of refinement as a V12. Now, it's a rather uncouth thing to try and ask a near three-ton, six-metre-long barge to dance on a country road, but it is in my job description, so uh, as we're here now, I'll put my foot down and see what happens. It's actually quite a pleasant surprise, this car, because it really does move. You would think that 450 odd horsepower might struggle just a bit in something that weighs as much as this without the aid of turbochargers to give it obscene amounts of torque, but it actually does a really good job. The handling is also much better than you might expect. It will go round a bend, and I did expect it to protest just a little bit. It did not. There is body roll, as you would expect it. This car is on air suspension, and let's be honest here, it's tuned for luxury, not sportiness. Even so, I'm rather impressed. This would make a better getaway car than you might think. It's actually not even all that daunting to place. Yes, there's lots and lots of bonnet ahead of you, 
but you can see nearly all of it. The Spirit of Ecstasy makes an excellent guide as to where the car is in the road. There is no way to shift gear manually. The closest thing you've got to a sport mode is a little button on the steering wheel here that says low. That essentially tells the engine to hold a few more revs, change a little bit later, and I'm told can make it change a little bit more aggressively too. So it's sort of a sport mode. The feel through the steering wheel is also impressive. Yes, the overall sensation is quite light, but get it into a bend, it does weight up just a little bit. It's fairly precise. Turning is actually quite impressive for something with such an enormous wheelbase. And you gain a confidence in this car very quickly that I wasn't expecting. In truth, my 7 Series, which was quite a bit smaller and lighter than this, wasn't really much more dynamic. The thing I'm really appreciating about this car right now is that Rolls have gone to an awful lot of effort to try and hide all the techno geekery and wizardry and all that sort of stuff like we saw in the walk around, which means you're not left with an awful lot to distract you when you're on the move. How's the turning circle? Obviously very important for a Rolls Royce owner. Actually, not horrendous. Parking it, as you might imagine, is not the easiest thing. This car regularly makes trips into London where car parks do have to be scouted in advance because there are not many of them that are going to be phantom friendly. This car's owner previously had a ghost and he said that by comparison that was much easier to just take out for a casual jaunt and find somewhere to park. But he did also say that where the Ghost, compared to most other cars, is certainly very upmarket, once you then start looking at Phantoms, you do realise all those little areas where Rolls-Royce have saved just a little bit of money. The Ghost has recently been heavily revised, but even so, with a fairly generous specification, I think one of those is going to set you back less than 300,000 quid. The modern day equivalent of this could be over half a million, and price tags of 600,000 plus are not unheard of. If I'm being brutally honest, there are plenty of other cars that I've driven which will go down a road quite well with a reasonable amount of comfort and plenty of power behind them. You can get all of that stuff and a whole host of toys as well in a Mercedes S-Class for about a tenth the price of this. What then is the difference? Why would you buy a Rolls-Royce? Well, for me, there's a depth to the engineering here. Just about every single piece of this car seems to be explicitly Rolls-Royce. Everything happens just a slightly different way. Thought and care has gone into nearly every single piece of this car. I'm really, really struggling to spot places where they've just reused BMW bits. In fact, about the only one I've seen thus far is the switch for the heated seat, which you can't even see when you're sat in the car anyway. Beyond that, it really is a very bespoke thing. One thing with this car, when you go to pull away from a junction, you do need to put your foot down a lot further than you might think. You find yourself pulling into traffic a bit slower than you want the first few times. Of course, what they're doing is trying to make everything happen nice and smoothly. The brakes can be a little harder to modulate. On the road, they're absolutely fine, but to try and bring this thing to a halt, perfectly precise, is tricky. We just passed a chap on a bicycle for the third time today, and I'm pretty sure right about now he's thinking that someone has employed the world's least competent driver. He's gotten himself so lost he's got no idea where he is anymore. These seats, I must confess, are a slight disappointment. They're extremely comfortable, really very nice, lovely leather and all that jazz, but they're not supportive. They don't really seem to hug you at all. There's no setting that would improve that. There's also just one little noise coming from down here, but that could be something in a door pocket moving. That is the only creak or rattle in the entire car. For the most part, it's silent. And you could stick the radio on anyway and you, you wouldn't hear it. Of course, the other reason you would then buy a Rolls Royce is for the customer experience. And I'm told by Sam that is impeccable. PA Wood, he says, are the best dealer he has ever dealt with. And he's dealt with a few of them. That's nice to know. I've been past that dealership a few times. If you know it, you'll know the one I'm talking about. If you don't, Google it. It's an amazing place. They are actually still a main Rolls-Royce dealer. I didn't realise actually sold new cars because they don't look like they do, but um, it's a spectacular showroom. 
other negatives really well you can sense that the suspension whilst comfortable is not particularly sophisticated so there's still an awful lot of movement in the chassis it never really shakes your bow or lumps and thumps but you can sense that it's just not that clever the modern ghost for example is really quite trick has active suspension planar technology whatever they call it and that is borderline supernatural I did have concerns that bringing a car like this on these roads would turn out to be an absolutely terrible idea, but I'm actually rather enjoying it. You are somewhat wary of the fact that you are taking up quite a bit of the road, but it's also the kind of car where taking things a little bit easier, going a little bit slower is far from a chore. And it's actually even more enjoyable. It means you get to spend more time behind the wheel and it's a nice place to spend time, I will confess that. The one piece of specification this car doesn't have that I personally would really like is a sunroof. I was surprised to find that they were actually an option at all. I think sunroofs aren't the sort of thing you tend to associate with a Rolls Royce. Certainly I don't. For the current generation of Phantom, the 8, they ditched the choice completely, presumably to aid with rigidity or something like that, I don't know. The new car is actually also smaller than this one, certainly in extended wheelbase guys anyway. The reason for that, I expect, is simple, because it gets you around some of the problems I talked about at the start of the video. I like driving this car a lot, but I'm not sure I want to get a whole new driving license just because of it. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this little video on the Rolls-Royce Phantom 7 extended wheelbase. I don't tend to cover too many ultra luxury cars on the channel, so if you have enjoyed today's video, please do pop into the comment section down below and tell me if you have or haven't. Likewise, if you happen to own a car in this sort of category and you'd like to see it featured on the channel, my email address is in the description of every video. Please do drop me a line. All that remains to say then is a huge thank you to this car's owners, Sam and Moonim. To you for watching, don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.